the controversy started four years ago when I presented a thought experiment at the 62nd annual meeting of the Institute of New Music and Music Education in Darmstadt 2008. And my question was, which consequences will the new technologies have for new music? I was very surprised by the reaction of the public. Most of the speakers have been really upset by the speech and only one composer, Orm Findahl, defended and supported the argument. So the text is translated into English. Into English. You find it on the website of the New Music Journal, Search. And I would like to read to you the first paragraph, which, which was meant to be a funny introduction. So in December 2006, in the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn, the chess program Dietfritz defeated the reigning world champion, the Russian Vladimir Kremlin. After six games with a score of 42 points, the computer was able to win two games, while Kremlin only managed to reach a stalemate four times. For the chess world, this meant that the battle of man against machine was lost, and that in the foreseeable future, there would be soon be no one left who could even achieve a tie with the chess computer. But what does this historic caesura in the game of chess mean for music? So, this uh, was, I thought, an entertaining introduction into the topic. Um, but it raised some questions and dis disputes. Yeah, in uh, 2009, I, um, I published an article uh, with the title On the Current State of Contemporary Music. Uh, to be exact, it was in, in uh, quotation marks this current state. This, yeah, the first question was what is, uh, what is, uh, or what is current state of material? That's in the, in the quotation marks. This what is material in music? Everyone uses this term, but you know, it is in, in not in any uh, important um, dictionary. It is defined what material in music is. By the way, it's the same with the word structure. Um, so I tried a simply a materi materialistic definition that's uh, um, not following Adorno, uh, but simply saying that first of all, it's, it's the material of music, the, so the sound of the instruments. Uh, this could be a possible definition, at least for me. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't think that I can give a definition which everyone is using, but at least for me, I wanted to to find a definition. So first, um, it's in the instruments. That's that's uh, a material of music. And and so and then the question, next question is: Okay, what is the so-called state of material? That uh, this is this famous term by Adorno, which is describing the, the general state of, of yeah of the composer's mind uh, in his age. Which lies in this uh, obscure material. So, okay, when I say it's the instruments, the material is the instruments, then the state of material is, um, uh, yeah, what kind of instruments are composers using? And the fact is that uh, much more than composers, institutions define the instruments. At least that's how I uh, experienced it. That. Uh, yeah, you, you, get, you, you, get, you, you get a, a certain instrumentation of an ensemble or for a current for an actual project, and there yeah, then you have to compose for this. So uh, that's why I then said institutions are composing. Um, Institutionen komponieren. And uh, to draw a solution was the digitalization. That this gives a, and then according to what Harry Lehmann already published before, that with the means of digitalization, Composers uh, become uh, more autonomous in defining their, their sounds, their material. Okay, so uh, the controversy accelerated when the composer Klaus Stefan Mankov criticized both positions of Greiber and Mein in his paper The New Technological Developments Computer and Music. Mankov's main, main accusation is that our argumentation is naive. He refers to the artificial research with the argument 
that new compositional programs will fail in the same way like there is no success in artificial intelligence. And second, it is, it is wrong, he says, uh, to speak about the digital revolution because it suggests a very big change and Monkov cannot see that the new digital technologies will have a huge impact for new music. Um, the third point, which I reconstruct now, um, I suggested in my thought experiment that there will be virtual orchestras for new music. I call this virtual orchestras e-player, because one can, by the help of an e-player, not only record scores, but also compose with them. Well, Stefan Markov argued that it would be impossible to build such a virtual orchestra for new music because you would have to record already for one instrument, for an oboe, uh, 50 billion samples. Uh, fourth, in analogy to the Photoshop program with which one can man manipulate any visual images, I suggested that there will be soon some soundtrack program with which one can easily manipulate new music sound patterns like phronia, texture, or a Klanggestalt from Latinum. Klaus Stefan Mankov again relate that such innovations are impossible or nonsense. The fifth point, Klaus Stefan Mankov rejects my main argument that a sociological argument is. Uh, namely that the digital revolution would change the new music institutions. In his opinion, digital technologies do not at all change the production of scores, the education of computers, the form of new music concerts, and um, the compositional process. Uh, six, in one of opinion, all technological innovations which I described have nothing to do with new music. At the last point, further Markov interprets the essay of Johannes Weidler as a career strategy, but not as a serious argumentation. I think this is a rude argument or not an argument at all. Then uh, I replied to, to this text of Markov. Now I have to say it's a bit difficult that we are um, we are now describing this controversy from our side. You know. It would also be fair if Markov was also sitting here. So this is our point of view, of course. Then please try to read on your own these texts, uh, because of course we have our our um, party. Okay, so I, I replied, digital natives or digital natives um, in the same um, magazine music text that was in 2000, beginning of 2010. Uh, so I've, uh, I was offended by Markov, so I had to reply. Uh, so digitalization, yeah, I say, digitalization is a big theme for society. And there is obviously uh, somewhere a generation gap, not only a generation gap, but uh, often it is, you can view it as a generation gap. And, and so this gap might also be in new music, for, um, for example, of ensembles, of curators, and aesthetically um, between a thought of structural composition and on the other hand a, say, postmodern or content orientation. Uh, orientated composition. So, concretely, that means uh, I have three points. Uh, with two institutions, for example, publishing houses versus internal, internet distribution. In my opinion, publishing houses are a dying, uh, dying um, culture. Um, I don't see, really see what the need of a publishing house is anymore. Uh, the fact is that composers are are making their scores and the publishing houses are only printing them out, more or less. And, but making scores uh, expensive, etc. Um, then the second point what Harry uh, described was the idea of using instrument samples, the so-called e-player, to compose or even to create kind of uh, recordings out of them, or also to, to even use them for performance. Uh, what I was actually doing already since 2005, uh, that I, for example, a piano piece 
which plays together with piano samples. Yeah? And with the samples you can all, do all these things, like Nan Carroll did, and, but it's not media sound, it's really high definition um, samples which um, can be combined with a live piano that sometimes really cannot uh, distinguish when listening to it. So, um, that is controversial, uh, I see the point, that I am, I'm using this simply, and I see the aesthetic potential, poten potential of it. And the third point is algorithmic composition. That's how I described that there might be a sound shop software which is capable of imitating well-known new music styles. And I think I'm very sure that this is possible to the degree of how good uh, style imitations can be. Uh, I don't think it's about that the computer is composing himself a, a masterpiece. We come to this point later. Um, so, and the conclusion in general is there is a democratization of certain aspects of new music. And then, so this, then we decided, okay, let's put this into a whole book, this controversy, on the initiative of the publisher um, Peter Mitchell. So, okay, there was a publishing house, uh, uh, I have to admit. <laughs> Yes, but it's about books, and uh, well, I say, um, still, well, I am having this device, but still people are reading books. I read most of books there, but as long as people are reading the printed books, there are, it's, of course, there can be publishing houses. I'm not against them. I simply see that there is a development that goes to, uh, to another system. So, then the, the controversy book uh, was, was done in the middle of 2010 and published in August 2010. Uh, it was the, the book uh, consists of these texts we've already described and we simply continued then the, the debate in the book itself. So, there was then again the response to, from Markov to me, where Markov describes that uh, this, uh, I don't know if it's well known here, um, uh, the so-called Ripple's Law. Does anybody know this? Uh, Ripple's Law means that cultural techniques never get abolished, or media never, never vanish, is the, is the so-called Ripple's Law, which I think is not true, because there are lots of media, for example, instruments that are no longer used, and uh, we, do, we do not uh, put uh, things into stone anymore. We are, using at least ink and paper. So, um, and, um, yeah, <clears throat> this thing about success, uh, yeah, somehow, uh, Michael was talking that, that I'm success, su successful with some pieces, and, uh, yeah, with, with the help of YouTube, for example. And, well, I think that it's, um, it's not only a... Um, uh, no, that's, yeah, of course not. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, always in the arts, uh, the, the success of a piece is combined with the success of a composer. That's simply the case. Um, um, okay, but, but Markov says uh, that he's against remix. He really is against remix culture. This is obviously a, a generation gap. That for him, this uh, remixing is not art. He really says this. It's not art. And um, he is, so he is, of course, against changing anything about copyright laws. Uh, and he is against mixing art disciplines. He says a photo is a photo, a painting is a painting, etc. Um, and his question back are, um, so what is good about the internet uh, and what is bad about it? So, yeah, he says, you are only looking on the good side, that there might be good aspects, but what about the bad aspects? Everything has all the, its bad aspects. Uh, what is an algorithm? What is the power of composition software? Um, I think that's, that's true that a lot of people simply don't know what is actually happening when algorithmic composition is, is being done. That's what I wanted to describe in my lecture tomorrow. Uh, is this remix attitude postmodern or not? Um, are we talking about new material or about new contents? That were the questions of Mankov. And my reply to that was um, I think um, Reaper's law is not true. We don't carve text into stone, for example. Um, and um, I believe that books will more and more be replaced by ebooks. It might take another uh, 
20, 30, 40 years, I don't know, but it will happen, I'm sure about this. So publishing houses are a dying culture. I regret, maybe it's, it's not good, but I think it's, it's simply a fact. Um, or you could also see that Peter Uplinger, German composer, is also very successful on the internet. Uh, here's one piece of him with his speaking piano, was used 500,000 times. So it's not meaningful divide between a fast and a long-enduring success that Malenkopf does. And I believe in remix culture, I believe we are all quoting all the time. Because this process of material um, research has come to an end, there are no more instruments uh, available, so he who writes for violin is copying, is what I'm saying. And, um, yeah, and I believe that uh, immaterial property is something very different than material um, property, and ideas are not property. Um, it is better for culture not to handle intellectual property like material property. And in my text, I'm describing then a composition software I was developing since a couple of years. That will be my lecture tomorrow. Um, and I was describing a piece of mine called Charts Music, which is um, was part of the debate because it's on the on the surface this piece is pop music since I used a pop uh, composition tool. Um, but I think it's new music, and I'm describing why in terms of a shift to content orientation, um, this piece is uh, new music, even though it's in a structural sense it is not, you know, not atonal music at least. Okay, um, then the second or the last uh, answer of Mankov, um, he still he doesn't see a big power in everything composition, and he is against my materialistic definition of material, he sticks to Adorno. Um, yeah. He regards me as someone dealing with big data quantities, whereas he wants to concentrate on things. And he defends the copyright law. Um, but he is definitely a cultural pessimist. A quotation by him is, uh, the 68s became dictators, what will the internet anarchists become? Um, and he doesn't believe in political music. It's really, really a bit hard to, 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 uh, to quote this, but yeah. Um, okay, well, another quote by him. My concept of remix is like mastur masturbation when viewing a couple having sex. Um, so, and his conclusion, the digital natives are naive. Okay, then we didn't continue with this anymore. All points were set about in, in this uh, direct uh, confrontation. Um, the book, uh, the final um, section of the book was free texts by all three participants. So my text is called Traktat, uh, which was a compound of um, several small texts. One is the text with the title Institutions are Composing, where I'm again describing with some examples where, in my opinion, institutions are much too much composing, where the composers, the composers, the real composers, they are only uh, fulfilling the already existing concept because the curators with their ideas, they are the, in fact the composers. Uh, then a text called Text Installations. Uh, where I'm describing the problems of um, conceptual, that music becomes more conceptual, and so we need new concept forms. And uh, the third text is titled Composing Means to Steal an Instrument. That's a variation of a, quote, of a sentence by Langmann. Yeah, where I'm uh, describing a, a bit aggressive political aesthetic, and of course a remix aesthetic. Um, then the fourth text about um, composing and copyright law. Um, I think this discussion is well known. The fifth is, uh, is, is in the same direction, and then I have a bit of collection of aphorisms around the theme. For example, my sentence, he who writes for violin is copying. And um, the seventh text I'm describing um, is called Standard Situations. Um, this uh, debates about new technology have arisen in, in the whole mankind. Uh, when the, uh, when, yeah, uh, there was well, open, always there were people who say we don't need it, it's not meaningful, um, etc. Uh, so I'm looking on a historical view on how this debate about new technology 
were uh, in history. And the last text was is called the Membrane Manifesto, which is a plea for new electronic instruments. Okay, uh, the title of Stefan Morkov's article, What is the Urban God? Uh, quotes Adorno, who said that the idea of contemporary art is to making things that are impossible to make. With most of the statements I agree here, but only because they are very general assertions. The problem is not that the text refers to ideas of Adorno or Derrida, but that this conception of urban God doesn't confront the topic of digitalization at all. It is an urban God conception as if the digital revolution doesn't take place, or at least doesn't matter. But of course this position is consistent with the previous arguments of Klaus Stefmankov, uh, uh, which suggests that the digital technologies are not a challenge for the new music system and don't have serious consequences for the self-understanding of a new music composer. The only reasonable position would be, from this perspective of Klaus Stefmankov, to defend the status quo because everything else would lead to a loss of the new music quality standards. So, I think I'm, I? Yes. And uh, also a second text by Mark of, um, about, about hearing. Um, this, um, he describes the joy and the erotic of listening okay. and that we always need the best instruments and the best electronics, not cheap software or devices and not concerts. I mean, I enjoy listening, of course, very much uh, and I enjoy using very good instruments, etc. But there's also a point where I prefer a MP3 sound to a very, very good sound because it can also become a good sound, can become boring. So for me, it was a two, this uh, attitude is a bit elitist, but well, new music might be elitist, that's for me not so much the point, but it's sentimental. Uh, okay. So, um, in the last article of the controversy book, I worked out a theory which explained more precisely some ideas in the thought experiment. The biggest misunderstanding of the thought experiment has to do with the character of the argument. It is a sociological argument and insofar not common to the music scene. I never wrote that the new technologies will change immediately music concepts or music ideas. This would be, of course, a naive point of view. The argument is that the technologies shift social structures in which the new music is produced, distributed, and reflected. And only in the result of that transformation can the possibility of certain ideas and concepts of music to be accepted or rejected change. Um, that the um, infiltration and the use of the new digital technologies in the field of new music will lead to uh, deinstitutionalization of the art system. That is my main argument, sociological argument. Um, so, here you see already a slide from my next uh, lecture, the infiltration and the use of new te digital technologies in the field of new music will lead to a deinstitutionalization of the new music system. The theory describes the change from a strong institutionalized to a weak institutionalized social system, which implies a loss of institutional power. I will explain and discuss this in detail in the following lecture. Okay, um, this, uh, this is for me too. Ah, oh, yeah, and the second part in this last article of the controversy book, um, um, I respond to Klaus Stefan Mankov's argument that it would be impossible to build a virtual orchestra for the new music instruments. I made by the help of Johannes Breitler a calculation how many samples of an above one would have to record in order to get an e-player which one could use in the new music. So I came to the result, or we came to the result, that one doesn't need 50 billion samples, but only 80,000, and this is a quite possible number. 
So that was the end of the book, but the controversy continues again in several um, magazines. For example, then the Swiss composer and sociologist Patrick Frank uh, wrote an article um, Controversy as Therapy, um, where he says thanks for the controversy. And um, he again describes these two points the shift to content orientation and the digitalization of music, and he says how they fit together. Uh, this new music has to be new, so it has to deal, for instance, with new technology. Interesting is that Frank refers to Jean Baudrillard's uh, simulation theory. He says that a lot of new music nowadays is only a simulation of new music from the 60s, 60s and 70s. Okay. And then Reimer Bürschlegel, the publisher of Musiktexte, wrote an article with the title On the Digital Revolution. And as you see already in the headline, the word digital revolution is written with quotation marks, what indicates a certain distance of the author towards this notion. And indeed, Bürschlegel argues that there is no reason to speak in the context of the new digital technologies about a revolution. In his opinion, the whole notion of digital revolution is an ad advertisement slogan in order to sell the new products which are based on the new technologies. Instead of the notion digital revolution, he suggests to speak about a digital evolution. In respect to Johannes Kreidel, he says it would be okay if Kreidel would use the word digital revolution in a private sense as his own compositional aesthetics. But Ulschlegel criticized the general pretension as if the digital revolution is a historical process or fact which will have consequences for other composers too. At the end, he says that Johannes Kreidel was believed in the same way like the serialists in a historical progress. And here I responded, I think, in the um, article Position, and I think the argumentation of Ulschlegel is very illustrative, but it misses the point. So therefore I wrote a response in the New Music Journal Position under the headline on the concept of digital revolution. Um, is the use of the term is digital revolution justified? That was my question. Uh, we do not call the Neolithic Revolution some 8,000 years ago and the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century a uh, revolution because of a single technological innovation like the plow or the steam engine, but because of the complex social implications of such innovations. And in the same way, I would be justified to speak about a digital revolution if the digital technologies change our way of life and work like the steam engine did 200 years ago. I think this is exactly the case, especially uh, do the new digital technologies change the social structure in the new music system? And so far, we do not observe a digital evolution like Hirschlager suggested, but a digital revolution. Oh, Philipp Dahl, composer and professor for electronic music in Freiburg, Germany, he is a former teacher of mine. He uh, wrote also in the same issue, Position and um, Article. Um, he is surprised that this discussion, which was present 20 years ago in other disciplines, now arise in new music, but better late than never. Um, and about the term digital revolution, not evolution, but revolution. He says then, digitalization goes back to the ancient times. Already the calendar is a digital description of the movements of Earth, Sun and Moon. And then he goes very deep into the theory and philosophy of digitalization and computerization. Um, the abstraction of data into digits, into zeros and ones. Um, this, this process of abstraction, um, is, um, this model should be regarded with its aesthetical implications, not only the surface of digital sounds or better notation software. He sees three consequences. First, um, it's comparable to the publishing houses, 
The studios for electronic music are less important nowadays since composers can work more autonomously um, on their laptop at home. And the internet changes our perception uh, due to these masses of, uh, of available music. And the computerization in general forces institutions to focus on that. Okay. So in this article, Klaus Stefan Mankopf responded, so the controversy continued, to my text about deinstitutionalization, which I published in the controversy book at the end. And in, I interpret this text, I interpret this text as a misreading of my sociological argument on purpose. But as always, the messenger of the bad news is blamed for the message. <laughs> Klaus Stefan Mankopf links my sociological theory of deinstitutionalization to a position of neoliberalism. If it, it is of course not an argument, but pure polemic. At the end, Klaus Stefan Mankopf speaks about such right-wing figures like Silvio Berlusconi and Georg Haider and makes thereby some implicit connection to the theory of deinstitutionalization. So, this polemic is based on a categorical failure. I describe and reconstruct an objective social process which one could only stop by destroying the internet and all computer-based technology. Klaus Stefan Markov reads my theory as a normative theory as I would provide the political concept which justifies a deinstitutionalization of the new music culture. What is wrong? But as I said, in my opinion, the deinstitutionalization is a social process which is triggered by the digital technology and has for different participants of the new music system different consequences. For some participants it is a positive development and for other participants it is a negative development. Then Volker Strebe, a musicologist and professor at the electronic studio of the Technische Universität in Berlin. Um, he also um, published an article in Music Texte, um, <coughs> Pre-Digital Consciousness. The same sentence that like, like for Finnendal, this discussion comes much too late. He, he says digitalization is already over, which was supposed to be a provocation. I disagree. Um, he, pre he replies mostly not to, to both of us but to Mankopf. Um, for example, he described he is describing the loudspeaker loudspeaker music that it also has performance qualities due to the concert hall, due to the mixing on the desk, for example. Um, and he says that Mankov has no idea, no idea about media music and conceptualism. Um, but then should he Mankov shouldn't call himself a music theorist. And um, Strebe says that Mankov is typical for the whole new music scene, which is very conservative in Strebe's opinion. Uh, they stick to old forms of music playing, old instruments, old concert situation, whereas in his opinion, sound art is the new new music. Then there was a, um, a radio uh, discussion between Mankov and me, and moderate moderated by Björn Gottstein, musicologist, uh, which um, was a one-hour discussion uh, with almost all points in it, and yeah, we concretized it on specific works, especially on my piece, um, Charts Music, um, the, what I described before, kind of pop music piece, a, a YouTube video, in fact, uh, which was quite successful, it was viewed over 500,000 times, and on the other side, Mankov's Pynchon Cycle, um, it's hard to summarize now this radio discussion. Uh, I would say not really new thoughts came up. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the text was published too. Uh, yeah, it, it was then the text that it was also published again, the, the transcription of the discussion. Okay, and then the composer Thomas Homo joined the controversy. He starts his article and Necessity as a driver of innovation, um, which is published in the Swiss journal Dissonance. So he starts his article with a remark that he is very inspired by the controversy and would like to give a practical example for deinstitutionalization. 
in new music. So he wrote a one hour long orchestral piece with the name Austrahila for 22 instrumentalists and a speaker, but there was no real chance for him to get the piece ever performed, so he knew this. So Hummel recorded every single voice from hundreds of such small samples he afterward compiled the piece on his computer together. The recording was published as a CD and instead of 20,000 euro, which a normal recording would cost if the piece had to rehearse and played by a real orchestra, Hummel paid only 2,700 euro for musicians plus some months of his own working time on the computer. After, Hummel, after Thomas Hummel could uh, substitute the institutions of the orchestra by computer technology, he even got a live performance, but only because he has had already produced a virtual CD. With, yeah. with orchestra you mean ensemble? Oh, ensemble. Yeah, but it was, he wrote it really for orchestra for 22, 22, so it's an Okay, but he, I think he speaks <coughs> for orchestra. For orchestra, yeah. yes, uh, in, in the audience. Okay. Um, so in, in the meantime, Thomas Hummel, I think last month, it's all in September, he published a virtual orchestra for new music, and there is even an e player available there. So you can go to the website, continue and uh, buy the product. And uh, recently, a book of mine has published uh, music, with music with music, music with music, uh, where there is uh, again, a new text of mine uh, entitled um, CODIT, uh, which is an acronym for Calculated Objects in Time. That's my software, which I will explain tomorrow. So, um, yeah. Now, what can a composition software nowadays really compose? And in this text, I wanted to concretize a lot of what was discussed before abstractly. Um, but I will talk about this tomorrow, uh, where I will describe in detail this software. Okay, in the last December, I published in the Swiss New Music Journal Dissonance the article Digital Infiltrations. And here I started to use for the first time Michael, uh, Michel Foucault's concept of dispositive for the controversy, and I will talk about this topic later in the lecture. And in response to this article, wrote Stefan Hetzel in the Bad Block of Music, an article which summarizes and highlights some uh, of my arguments. The blog is a blog of the New Music Journal Neue Musikzeitung, and this article is a good example that today intelligent observers from outside of the new music scene, which some years ago would probably have no access to such a discussion, have now a voice in the discourse. An analogy with the work of Thomas Hummel is this and other example for a deinstitutionalization and a democratization process of this art scene. Um, yeah, and in addition, there was, for example, also in Darmstadt 2010, uh, a panel at the end of the Darmstadt Affairing course with Om Finnendal, Pjörn Bernstein and me, where we talked with the public and discussed about digitalization. Uh, and very similarly, a year later, also in the Experimental Studio in Freiburg, with almost the same people. Um, for me, interesting was, um, I had one thought, we didn't talk about this, uh, that was what Markov said that, okay, it might be that the case that uh, computers or general machines, they are making things easier for us. But that's bad for, for arts, that's bad for composition. Um, you, you won't have to work hard. If it's too easy, that cannot be good for the arts. Um, Om Finnendal said uh, that for him, due to digitalization, in fact, compo composing becomes much more difficult. Um, and again, someone from the audience said that the whole discussion was led in the pop world already 10 years ago. I have to say, um, yes, some people say this, and I always ask, okay, please give me the, this text about, them, but, about it. But no one could then show, show me really this, uh, this text about such a discussion. So at least in the new music arts world, in the new music world, this discussion wasn't led and it has to be. Um, 
and uh, well, I'm a composer, so in um, 2010 I made a music theatre piece, Feeds Hören Sie Far, which was a new music talk show, you could say. So I decided uh, why not um, including it in the theatre piece. So um, this controversy was a, a, a splendid material, and so I created a scene with a fictive dialogue with the inventor of the MP3 codec. Um, so and we transformed the talk live into very bad MP3 sound. And I took then the role of Markov and quoted sentences of Markov's uh, from the, of Markov from the book. Um, you can watch this scene on YouTube. So in, in August and September this year, there have been two radio transmissions which referred to the controversy. Um, on top of new media and uh, another radio transmission about uh, new music and ph philosophy. So, and in the last two years, I wrote this book, The Digital Revolution of Music, a Philosophy of Music, which will be published by Short Music in October of this year. And I would like to invite you and to present you in detail this book in the lecture I will give after a short break. Thank you.